Okay, so we got one more talk, and then we'll have a little bit of a panel. And this is not on your program, but Dr. Bohannon's going to talk to us about um, lower extremity aneurysms, femoral and palpatial aneurysms. Todd, welcome. Thanks for coming up. Mm. Long walk from back there. Yes, thanks for having me. All right, and this goes forward, I think. Yeah, green. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. One more to go. Uh, we're going to talk about low extremity aneurysms, and in particular, popliteal aneurysms, which are the, kind of the most common. And uh, in your anatomy labs and whatnot, you can look at all these uh, these uh, these uh, structures or whatnot in the popliteal uh, fossa. They're always on the pictures and the line drawings are a lot easier than when you actually are seeing them in situ. Um, the popliteal uh, uh, normal diameter is approximately a, a centimeter, uh, with the proximal and mid segments a little larger than the distal. Uh, we consider a popliteal aneurysm uh, to be a focal dilatation of about 50% of the uh, uh, normal diameter, so roughly about one and a half centimeters in diameter to consider something an aneurysm. Popliteal aneurysms are about 80% of the peripheral aneurysms. Uh, most are uh, atherosclerotic in origin, uh, about 95% or more. Now, uh, there's a lot of these odd little bits that you may or may not see uh, through your career are, are very uh, not encountered very much, but they're important to know about, particularly adventitial cystic disease, entrapment, FMD, thromboangiitis thrombo obliterans. Uh, most uh, popliteal aneurysms are, uh, are occur in men, older men, smokers, and the usual uh, stuff. But, but it can be prevalent in about 1% of men in 65 to 80 uh, year uh, group. Um, the uh, maximal, uh, so on average, they may present at about uh, three centimeters. One important thing is that these, an these aneurysms uh, can prune off or pick off the uh, the uh, tibial runoff. So you can see up to, uh, on some of these patients, 70% of them will just have a single uh, uh, tibial runoff vessel. Now, uh, an important a little uh, thing to, to note, particularly when you're looking at pe people as a whole, is, uh, is people who have abdominal aneurysms uh, may have about one or two percent of them may have a popliteal aneurysm. It's always on the physical exam when you're uh, seeing an aneurysm patient to look everywhere. Uh, now, if, you're, uh, if you, someone has an abdominal aneurysm, you want to check behind the knees. It's very important if you're seeing someone for a popliteal aneurysm uh, that you uh, check for an abdominal aneurysm because it's even more prevalent. So if you have one, po one side popliteal aneurysm, it's about 40% uh, of them may have an abdominal aneurysm. Now, if they're bilateral popliteal aneurysms, up to 70% may have an abdominal aneurysm. So you don't want to miss, miss that and focus just on the uh, popliteal. Uh, about 60% uh, percent, uh, percent uh, symptomatic, whether it be claudication or with acute limb ischemia. Rarely you see them rupture, um, and, uh, and, uh, but uh, that can happen. Um, uh, and then the, uh, so in the, uh, this is pretty similar there. So we look at sizing and uh, risk of uh, limb ischemia. The uh, small aneurysms uh, particularly have a low risk of, of limb ischemia. Usually the ones that are less than two, two centimeters we consider low risk of ischemic potential unless they have certain features like a bad, bad high thrombus loads. So as they get larger, uh, the uh, risk of, uh, of uh, limb ischemia increases. So indications for intervention, the, uh, the uh, patients can become symptomatic with ischemia, uh, whether it be acute or chronic ischemia, claudication, or they can have compressive symptoms, particularly compression on the uh, veins and calling, causing swelling. Um, it's uh, and, uh, indications to treat, uh, often is, you'll get a number of about two centimeters diameter as a sort of a threshold to consider uh, treatment. Uh, you also want to take into account uh, the uh, thrombus burden because there's a risk for distal embolization, and that thrombus burden can be a high risk of, uh, of, of limb loss, and all are people who have a poor uh, distal runoff. Uh, kind of the common re repairs open-wise, uh, there's medial and posterior. Uh, people tend to do more medial approaches than posterior. Stent graft repair is also uh, becoming more common. 
Now, when you consider the open versus the endovascular repair, uh, open repair, there's not many restrictions uh, other than if you have no target vessel to, uh, to uh, bypass to. For the endovascular repair, uh, now certainly if there's a superficial femoral occlusion, uh, the, uh, the popliteal artery is thrombosed or ruptured. Uh, you have a long uh, popliteal artery uh, extending into the mid SFA or extending close to the tibial perineal trunk single vessel runoff or where your stent placement would jail out uh, the other tibials and cause you just to have a single vessel runoff. And when you look at people who uh, are candidates for our popliteal aneurysm, uh, candidates for repair, uh, tend the asymptomatic patients tend to be uh, more eligible uh, for uh, endovascular repair uh, compared to the symptomatic ones, which makes sense as the symptomatic ones have more occlusions and, and less runoff. Uh, and looking at open repair, uh, there's certainly elective versus emergent, medial posterior, and what kind of conduit to use. Uh, elective repair, uh, which makes sense, is, is uh, our emergent repair is an independent predictor of limb loss with patency being much better uh, if uh, it is done electively as well as with, the, uh, with uh, limb salvage. Uh, on, uh, in regards to the medial approach, uh, you can generally do any uh, size uh, uh, unless there's a compressive symptoms. Uh, so you go above and below the aneurysm uh, and, uh, and ligate uh, the, uh, the popliteal aneurysm, uh, per preferably a venous conduit if available. Uh, and however, just with the ligation, there's con concern for a continued growth of the aneurysm. Uh, this was an uh, interesting patient that we had a few months ago, which uh, I can't remember the last time I saw this. This was a ruptured and thrombosed 7.2 uh, centimeter aneurysm that, uh, that uh, we, uh, we approached. Here, this is a medial approach. Uh, this is larger than you would typically do. This was showing, this is taking down all the medial attachments so we could get to the aneurysm and, uh, and uh, after we got proximal and distal control and then uh, ligate, debulk it, and then ligate the uh, geniculates. Um, so on the uh, posterior approach, which is a, which is a neat operation, uh, it's good for focal or short aneurysms. Uh, large, large aneurysms that have compressive symptoms, so you can debulk the aneurysm. Uh, you expose it, you open the aneurysm sac, uh, put an interposition graft, and perform an endoaneurysmorophy where you wrap the aneurysm sac back over the graft. You can ligate the geniculate branches. That's where you can get a, a low chances of having, uh, having progressive uh, uh, enlargement of the aneurysm because you're actually uh, ligating those branches and put in a short interposition graft. And prosthetic R vein grafts actually do quite well. So vein grafts, uh, the patencies are similar regardless uh, of approach. The prosthetic grafts, patencies are better uh, for prosthetic in the posterior approach versus medial. And when you're looking at the posterior approach, either vein or prosthetic works well. Uh, endovascular repair, just some aspects of that. Uh, typically, uh, you want to make sure you have good proximal and distal landing zones. And they tend to do better with uh, the more, uh, more tibial runoff vessels. Uh, relative, our contraindications, like on this one, the aneurysms uh, if you, involving the, S, the SFA are long, long segment of aneurysms, involvement of the anterior tibiality origin, uh, very bad tortuosity, are real large aneurysms like this CAT scan shows with the compressive symptoms because you're not really going to be alleviating the compressive symptoms. Uh, you want to have at least a centimeter, centimeter, half. Uh, Proximal and two to three centimeters distal uh, landing zones, uh, about 10% oversizing. Uh, single stent, stent if possible. If you're going to do multiple stents, you want at least three centimeters of overlap. Uh, the uh, patency rates are reasonable. However, there's a wide uh, reported uh, uh, varying uh, results. But the reintervention re re rate in, uh, in these can be up to 26%. Uh, this uh, shows the, you know, that there can be, since this is a mobile area, there can be stent fractures and, uh, and up to 17%. Uh, so it's something to consider in a younger age patient, certainly with multiple uh, uh, stents being placed. Um, 
Now, it's an important thing about apopatial aneurysms and, and is, is acute ischemia from thrombolysis, or thrombosis or thromboembolism is uh, using thrombolysis. Uh, the primary indication is if you do not have a visible, visible target. Um, and in this, uh, this uh, Swedish registry, uh, they looked at uh, patients who presented with uh, popliteal aneurysms and acute ischemia. The, uh, um, they, about 42% of them had pre-op thrombolysis and they were found to have improved uh, target uh, runoff targets for revascularization, and that's with a median uh, infusion time of about a, a day, and they had decreased uh, fasciotomies and amputations. And uh, they're comparable, uh, I think medial, I guess the medial approach, the important thing to remember is that you're just ligating above and below the aneurysm, so there can be an, an, an increase in uh, aneurysm growth and, uh, and uh, our endo leak. And uh, open and endo repairs have, uh, have pretty good outcomes. I think, uh, uh, I think that should pretty much be it. You certainly want to survey these patients after intervention. Um, uh, keep an eye out for endo leaks of type two with the endo grafts and with the medial approach. And vein grafts can have aneurysmal degeneration as well. Thank you very much.